Hi folks, welcome back. I hope you're all doing well. Now on this channel, I've covered a lot of papers that talk about virtual machines and containers and unikernels. And I thought today I would look at a paper that looks at the broad history of all these technologies. The paper is by Alison Randall from the University of Cambridge and does a deep and comprehensive survey of the full history of these technologies. If you're interested in stuff like this, I'd really recommend you give the full paper a read but I'm going to pick and choose some of my favorite bits and cover those. Near the beginning of the paper, you'll find this really cool diagram which traces the timeline and lineage of all these technologies. It all really started back in the 1950s with the idea of multiprogramming, which then evolved into capabilities, into many of the early IBM systems that pioneered the idea of virtual memory, Along the same time, there was also Unix that came along. And on Unix were built techniques like Shroot, which was the first file system namespace isolation technology, which in turn later evolved into other namespace technologies, which eventually became modern containers. In parallel, you had companies like VMware pioneering virtual machine technology and also efforts like QEMU and KVM and Zen, which were leading the virtual machine part of this evolution. Let's look at some terminology before we get too deep into the paper. The paper uses the term container to refer to a technique that provides process isolation but on a shared kernel. This contrasts with virtual machines where the distinguishing feature is the virtual machine providing either replication or emulation of real hardware to the software that runs inside the virtual machine. Now note that often there can be a spectrum of techniques ranging from containers to virtual machines. So it's not a totally binary distinction. And both of these technologies trace their origins back to the 1950s when the concept of multiprogramming was first introduced. And the idea was to have some sort of basic multitasking and context switching between different processes as well as I.O. running on multiple CPUs on a single machine. As soon as you had this idea of multiprocessing, the question immediately came up of what it meant to secure these processes. And it very quickly became obvious that isolation or processes not interfering with each other was a core security and design requirement of all these systems. This is when the idea of a trusted and privileged operating system kernel first came into being. The kernel would have full access to all hardware, but then provide a limited and secure subset of that access and that functionality to individual processes running on that kernel. Already we see that as soon as multiprogramming came along, things like security and isolation and separating and limiting privileges became key design considerations. And the early work on virtual machines was a logical extension of this kind of work on multiprogramming. The big leap from multiprogramming to virtual machines, of course, was the idea that you could carve out small chunks of resources from the host machine, the real physical host machine, and then put them together to present the illusion of a real machine to a process running within that virtual machine. These ideas found their expression in a number of systems developed at IBM in the 60s and 70s. But that was back in the mainframe era. As we get into the 80s, we start getting into the era of smaller computers. And these did not have all the hardware support for things like virtual memory or trapping sensitive instructions, which made implementing virtual machines on them very challenging. Now, around the same time, Unix was being developed at Bell Labs. And in the late 1970s, they added a feature called Shroot, which lets you have an isolated view of the file system. And as Unix continued to be developed, 
the idea of truth which was to take a certain kind of resource and provide some sort of isolation around it was extended to other kinds of resources as well so we had things like namespaces and c groups at, and sec comp and so on and when you take all of these secure isolation techniques together that lets you build what we now know as containers one really interesting point in the design space was the burrows b5000 architecture which had a lot of interesting hardware level support for this kind of isolation it tagged its memory according to whether it held code or data and allowed executing only the code parts of memory not the data parts of memory and also ensured that a process could only access its own memory now let's look at some of the projects that led to what we now know as modern virtual machines in the late 90s there was the disco research project at stanford which built some early virtual machine technology and that same team went on to found vmware it's interesting to note that around the time that VMware came out, the x86 architecture did not have good hardware level support for virtualization. It did not trap all sensitive instructions. And to work around this, the early versions of VMware had to employ a form of binary rewriting so that they could trap all these sensitive instructions and let guest operating systems run unmodified inside VMware. In the early 2000s, we have the Denali Research Project from the University of Washington, which introduced the key idea of paravirtualization. And this is the idea that the guest operating system has some modifications to work in tandem with the underlying virtualized hardware architecture. So while you have to make modifications to your guest operating system, you still preserve the full application level interface so that the guest applications can run unmodified. Paravirtualization was the key idea behind the Zen project as well. But one of the key innovations of Zen was that it allowed for very precise resource accounting. And the reason they did this was so that they could individually build tenants for the resources they were using on physical machines. And this is what led to Amazon offering some of its first cloud virtual machines as a service. Now, one of the classic arguments in favor of virtual machines has been that virtual machines are less complex and hence have a smaller attack surface area in other words because they are less complex they are more secure however if you look at some modern virtual machine implementations that's not true they're quite complex they're quite large some notable exceptions to that are google's cross vm that's the vm used in the chrome os operating system as well as Amazon's Firecracker, which was initially a fork of CrossVM. Also notably, they both use Rust as the implementation language, which gives them good memory safety. In practice, over the years, there have been several well-known security exploits in virtual machines, and some particularly let you detect whether you're running in a virtual machine or not. So the ideal promise of virtual machines, which was that you couldn't tell whether you were on a real machine or a virtual machine, does not quite hold in practice. Now, when we start looking at modern containers, I think that the author here makes a really interesting meta point, which is that the time span in which containers became popular coincides with a major shift in how people communicated and published technical advances. And if you look at projects like Docker and Kubernetes, most of the literature about those technologies has been written by the users rather than the primary developers of those technologies. And the medium of publication has been not the traditional academic literature, but things like blogs or YouTube videos and so on. So as we saw before, the truth mechanism in early Unix was the very first isolation technique, but that only dealt with the file system.
FreeBSD later implemented jails, which in addition to the file system also isolated processes and network resources. And this idea of process isolation kept getting more and more complete implementations to cover things like users, devices, inter-process communication, and so on. And if you take all these isolation technologies together, you get what we now know as modern containers. The conventional wisdom has been that containers have much better performance compared to virtual machines, but that has not really stood up to closer scrutiny. Some benchmarking has shown that things like KVM have much higher overhead when they're doing I.O., but you can mitigate that simply by avoiding small I.O. operations and batching them together to do larger I.O. operations. One notable point in favor of containers is that since container guests share the same kernel as the host, all the effort you put into improving the security of the kernel improves the security of containers as well. When it comes to security, you'll remember, of course, that recently we've had some very foundational exploits with things like Spectre and Meltdown. And these are foundational because they involve things like speculative execution and out-of-order execution that are really key elements of modern microprocessor architectures. So obviously virtual machines and containers are affected by these exploits as well, and there hasn't been a very satisfactory mitigation to these yet. It's very easy to imagine a scenario where a malicious workload tries to hop from physical machine to physical machine until it finds one where there are some secrets to steal. Typically, you'll find these kinds of threats mitigated by non-technical means. So if some company is really worried about the secrecy of its workloads running on a public cloud, they'll negotiate some clause in their contract which says that all their workloads must run exclusively on a given set of machines and those machines won't be shared with workloads from other companies. And of course, in addition to containers and virtual machines, we also have this unique spot in the design space of unikernels. And unikernels are really interesting because they blow up this whole concept of having a kernel and an operating system, and they simply have one very highly specialized application along with all the basic operating system functionality that it needs coupled into one binary that directly runs on the guest virtual hardware. Typically, it has taken a lot of engineering effort to build unikernel applications, but some modern efforts like Linux binary compatible unikernels have tried to address that. So unikernels is, I think, a really interesting design space to watch out for. So that was a look at a survey paper which looked at the history of containers and unikernels back from their roots in multiprogramming in the 1950s all the way to modern virtual machines and containers. I hope you enjoyed that and I will see you next time. Thank you very much.